Good afternoon and welcome to Smart Music's webinar, Amping Up Student Engagement with Jason Gerth. My name is Michaela Graham, Senior Event Specialist for Make Music, and I will be running everything in the background for our session today. Before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes for you. At the end of the webinar, we will provide a link to the certificate of attendance for today's session, as well as a handout with the slides from today's presentation. Please note the certificate of attendance will only be available for live attendees and not for the replay. If you have any questions for our presenter throughout the session, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box. We will have time for Q&A at the end of today's session. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our wonderful presenter today. Jason Gerth is currently band director and teacher leader at Southeast Polk High School in Pleasant Hill, Iowa. He has received numerous education awards and most recently, the Iowa Bandmasters Association honored Jason with the Carl King Distinguished Service Award for Active Educators in 2021. Jason serves on the executive board of the Iowa Alliance for Arts Education and was the 2019-2020 president of the Iowa Bandmasters Association. Jason, thank you so much for being with us today. I will let you take it away. Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, it is such an honor and pleasure to be with you today. Um, I want to thank, I'm just going to try to make sure I can see everything okay here. I, I want to I thank Michaela and Smart Music for sponsoring this event. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here. For those of you who are going to be uh, tuning in at a later at replay, I want to thank you for, for tuning in to watch it whenever you're watching this. Um, and uh, I, I am, um, I'm really excited to present this idea with you. I love metaphors. Um, I also uh, love dad jokes just as much. So um, I hope that, uh, and pray that, uh, and tell you what, I am positive that this session will leave you charged up and ready to bolt into the classroom. And again, as Michaela says, if this conversation sparks discussion, uh, there will be some free time at the end if you have any questions or have techniques that you've also found successful in your classrooms as well. Now, by no means is this an exhaustive or definitive uh, presentation on the topic of student engagement. Um, and we're gonna dig into some thoughts and ideas uh, both in and out of the classroom. So um, just a little bit more about me, maybe before we begin. Um, I just finished my 26th year of teaching and the last 16, as Michaela said, um, has been in the Des Moines metro area. Uh, my teaching responsibilities include co-directing our marching band, uh, running our high school jazz program and running our third, conducting our third concert band. And that concert band is primarily freshmen. And I've spent the last 16 years working with that level of, of group. So um, I have um, learned a lot about improving engagement with, with students in rehearsals. Um, so I wanna begin with, with a quote. Um, I was a part of the Iowa Bandmasters Association virtual conference this last week. And we were honored to have Dr. Frank Battisti, uh, pr a professor emeritus from the New England Conservatory and just a brilliant, brilliant teacher and musician as one of our presenters. And in one of his sessions, he said, ensemble at its, very, at its best is a collaborative experience. Everyone has a gift to share when they walk in the room. And that, I think, encapsulate, encapsulates a lot of what we're going to talk about today. So. I do want to now talk a, a little bit about a story that kind of helped to to spark this this uh, th this topic. Um, it was a collision of coincidences uh, back in the early part of this year, uh, maybe January, December. Um, I was working with a group of people, a group of great teachers, um, on a leadership retreat we were going to present to students. It was called the Recharge Retreat. And um, through the Upbeat Global team, it's a fantastic group of educators. There was a lot of talk about energy and about reigniting spark and all of those things. And about that same time, uh, we began to be in person again after being in, in hybrid and virtual in our first semester. We began to be in person more uh, after the new year. And there were several rehearsals in a row where I was leaving feeling really drained and exhausted 
but I noticed my students were almost bouncing out of the classroom. It seemed like the energy in our class was very much one way. Um, I was pushing out all of the energy and our students were, my, my students were absorbing it and not reflecting it back. Um, the give and take was only give and it was only coming from me. It seemed like I was the only one caring. Uh, I was the only one putting in the effort and it seemed like I was the only one working on a group project like we've all probably experienced in our, in our, in our high school lives. Would you, in the chat, would you drop a me too if if you have in any way ever felt like this coming out of a rehearsal. Um, we've also noticed in the pandemic that our Zoom classes are inherently one-sided and the work we have to put in to increase engagement is off the charts and sometimes we get very little return. The black boxes and blank stares almost taunt us. Um, of course, the black boxes and, and blank stares presently uh, Excluded, of course. Um, drop an amen in the chat if if you have felt as you've been working through Zoom the same way that it's just been so hard. There's a, a funny story there. Um, speaking about speaking of Zoom, we were virtual for just a couple of weeks totally, and um, I, I I was trying to present. Um, I was trying to present a, a an audio recording and manage having students hear it and play along and X, Y, and Z. And I, I, I was playing a recording of a piece through smart music that our students were to be playing along with because it has the metronome and everything. And we played through this entire, well, I thought we were, this, this entire four minute piece of music. And then the kids are like, hey, Mr. Girth, were we supposed to be hearing anything? Are you supposed to be sharing audio? And then, of course, there's that little button, you know, at the bottom, bottom left, I think, where you're supposed to share computer audio. Completely missed it. And we lost a lot of time that way. But, but uh, I, I learned, and I learned to laugh when it comes to technology. Um, because, good Lord, uh, if we can't laugh at ourselves, I mean, who can we laugh at, right? So, anyway. Um, okay. So... Let's see, where was I? Okay, um, but so we see, we feel the drain of energy ourselves coming out of some of those rehearsals and situations, um, but there are also those other situations where we feel equally tired when we leave those rehearsals, but we leave them with a smile on our face. And I began to think, okay, what's, what's the difference between those two? Um, and I think, I, I think I, I think I happened onto it, I, and I, I think a light bulb went off. Um, and what I was experiencing was a classic case of incorrect energy flow. I was DC, I was direct current, and not AC, alternating current. And I'll, I'll get to that more in, in a little bit. Um, I think that we, which is everyone in our rehearsal space, has tremendous power. We are all atoms waiting to be split, water ready to turn turbines, wind ready to spin windmills. Um, and our goal as teachers is to harness and amplify this power with intention and planning in order to be efficient conductors of electricity. Another dad joke for you. <laughs> so our goal must be to share responsibility and expect accountability. And we must ask ourselves, how can we foster a responsive environment? What can we do to help our students learn to respond? And how can I encourage my students to respond? I think it's a worthy goal every day to ask yourself these questions before every rehearsal. Now, I wanna delve into a little bit of history uh, before, we, before we move on, because part of this presentation has to do with AC and DC, of course. Um, the current war, between Edison and Westinghouse and Tesla. So in this corner, we had Thomas Elva Edison back in the 1880s. He had just invented the light bulb. His engineers um, had planned to create power plants to, to power these light bulbs with direct current. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the money was being poured into this technology. DC, direct current, was cheap. It was safer than the alternative. It was stored easily and modulated like, like dimmer switches. Um, the, um, however, the range was limited 
because the voltage could not easily be amplified. And that meant small power plants had to be set up within my, about a mile of, of, of the end user. So think about a mile radius or for around every power plant. Um, DC flows only in one direction. And today, uh, so you know, um, everything with a battery runs on DC from cell phones to Tesla's. And in this corner, we had Thomas Westinghouse and his pal Nikolai Tesla. He, he purchased all of Tesla's patents um, after Tesla was shortchanged by, by Edison. And uh, Westinghouse was a big fan of alternating current, mostly because it can be inexpensively amplified to higher voltages, sent a long way away, and brought back down to usable uh, voltage. And, and it would enable large scale power grids to to uh to, to be built um exactly what we need in the united states and, and around the world and so while dc travels in one direction the difference here is alternating current travels both ways across the power lines and ac is what we plug into in, in, for, in, into the wall today so how does this compare to our ensembles and energy flow well um, DC, also known as direct current, we just talked about that, could also be referred to as director control. Uh, there's a single point of origin, the sage on the stage. There's a total top-down control. Students will sit and get. The energy is flowing only in one direction, out from the teacher or the director. It won't take the ensemble very far before the energy begins to weaken. And the difference, though, on, on the other side of the coin is alternating current, or we can call aggregate collaboration. Big word there, but aggregate means a whole formed by combining several typically disparate elements. And I can think of no better conglomeration of disparate elements than a room full of teenage brains. So I thought that fit pretty well. It's a collaborative culture. Students are engaged and thinking as active musicians. The energy is flowing both ways and the ensemble learning is supercharged and far reaching. Now, there are several considerations for us to get there. First of all, energy efficiency. And energy efficiency can come from routine, consistency, and unified thinking. We can also do this through a robust power grid. And that's achieved through trust and empathy in our classrooms. And then, of course, empowering ensemble engagement through questioning. So let's talk about the first one, energy efficiency. And John Wooden um, is a hero of mine. He was a famed UCLA basketball coach, for those of you who don't know. My, my youngest son, Nathan, loves basketball. And I've just recently turned him on to, to the to the thoughts of discipline and doing the small things right of John Wooden. He won in his team is at UCLA won 10 NCAA national championships in 12 years between 1963 and 1975. And he created a framework of success with his players based on even the smallest of details. Now, I couldn't find a recording of him telling the story about socks and shoes nor uh, either audio or video. So I hope you'll indulge me if I read um, a quote of his. It, it's a longer, it's actually a little story of his. And this is what John Wooden uh, says about putting socks on. And I, I think you'll understand that it's, it's the smallest details that makes a big difference. Um, again, he says, I think it's the little things that really count. The first thing I would show our players at our first meeting was how to take a little extra time putting on their shoes and socks properly. Sidebar, these are the best players in the country coming from all over the place that are on scholarships and are, are, are thought of as the best. And he's taken time for this. The most important part of your equipment is your socks and shoes. You play on a hard floor. So you must have shoes that fit right. And you must not permit your socks to have wrinkles around the little toe where you generally get blisters or around the heels. It took just a few minutes, but I did show my players how I wanted them to do it. Hold up the sock, work it around the little toe area and the heel area so that there are no wrinkles. Smooth it out good. Then hold the socked foot up while you put the shoe on with the shoe spread apart, not just pulled on the top laces. 
you tighten it up snugly by each eyelet. Then you tie it. Then you double tie it so it won't come undone because I don't want shoes coming untied during practice or during a game. I don't want that to happen. I'm sure that once I started teaching that many years ago, it did cut down on blisters. It definitely helped. But that's just a little detail that coaches must take advantage of because it's the little details that make the big things come about. Now, um, Michaela will share with you at, at the end of the presentation, the slide deck for this. So there are a few books that I'm going to reference during the presentation. And one of them, the first one is, is one that I absolutely love. John Wooden through um, uh, his, his co-author, Steve Jameson wrote quite a few books based on his philosophies. And this one is a tiny little book with just brain droppings of John Wooden. And this is one, if you've never heard of John Wooden, or any of his teaching philosophies, this would be a great place to start. Wouldn't a lifetime of observations on and off the court. And again, this will be in the, uh, the slide deck that Michaela will share. Now, when it comes to art and creativity, I think structure also has a huge role to play. And famed designer Charles Eames, who designed the Eames chairs, and, and they're, you see them pictured there, um, they're fiberglass chairs. These are the first kinds of chairs that, that he designed. Um, I've sat in these over the years and didn't realize that they were that they were as um, trendy or as groundbreaking as they were. But he does he said that design depends largely on constraints. Interesting. We have to have the lines to color in sometimes to uh, to know where to go. Uh, Nicholas Cole also wrote in a magazine article for Inc. Magazine uh, recently. He wrote, the point of structure is to give yourself the permission to make time for something you want to do. Once you begin that thing in itself, you are free to go about it however you'd like. Now here's, here's the real kicker. If structure is what creates the opportunity, then creativity is what makes the opportunity unfold. So I think increasing engagement in our classroom needs that framework for our students so we can open the doors wide to creative aggregate collaboration. So how can we create that structure? What can we control in our classrooms? Well, we can control how kids enter the room, where their stuff goes, what they do when they get there, what they do at the end of the class, how to pack up the room. Uh, Paula Kreider, who's a friend of mine, told me once in a, in, it, that, that when she was a junior high band director way back in the day, she had her routines so set that the kids had this calming effect when they came into the room. It was almost as if they were taking a Ritalin shower. Those are her words. We all, we all had a laugh at, at that. Um, and what we do, what we do in, in our rehearsals is or for our school year rather, is we start the year with a slide deck that goes through all of our procedures. And this might be a little small for you on your screen, I apologize, but um, we start with our class procedures and we lay out the basics of what we do, where the instruments go, um, what we do during class, how the hallway should look outside the band room, what the band room should look like, we talk about the timing of our rehearsals and how we begin our rehearsals, what students should do when they arrive. Um, for example, I'll have the flutes and clarinets take their instrument cases out of their lockers and bring them to their seats and put their instruments together there because our instruments storage room is smaller and we don't want trombone players climbing over flute players to get to their instruments because we know they will. Um, we talk about um, what percussionists will do because they need guidance more than any group and i'm not stereotyping it's it's science um and i'll, I'll tell the kids to look for bell work on on the uh, on the on the on the whiteboard and we also will, will show the kids and this is just a snippet of, of what we'll talk with our kids about um what to do when the rehearsal ends we'll tell them when we're going to end rehearsals um and what to do what to do with 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 sticks and mallets and and what to do with the instrument storage and all of all of those things. Uh, Mickey Smith, who is the 2020 Grammy Music Educator of the Year, and I were talking last year, and he he had told me, and I just filed this away, that um, he spends 
multiple rehearsals, almost, a, I think he might have said a couple of weeks of, of every other day rehearsals, ingraining the procedures for the school year. And he said that in middle school often, and I, I, I believe this, often in middle school, students will be running to running to uh, recess, they'll be running to the lunchroom, they'll be running to leave school. He said his kids get in trouble for running to band because they're so excited to be there. So um, if you haven't done uh, very clear procedures like this in your ensembles, it will free up time um, beyond belief. Another way that we can create some structure and some order in our classrooms is through efficient and unified thinking. Uh, there are some common understandings that we already have when we're teaching. You don't even realize it. Our counting system is a unified system, is, is a unified approach, whether it's the Eastman system, whether it's Takadimi, whether it's the Kodai method, whether it's the Gordon method of counting. All of those are systems that we understand and that our students understand. And I'm talking about unifying some things so that it increases the current between teacher and student and we can talk more about common understandings that will take us farther faster. Um, so what else can we unify? These are some things that work for me in my classroom. In my jazz ensembles, I talk about where our students should listen all the time. We call it the 40-40-20 rule, where 40% of our listening is going to our drummer, the timekeeper. 40% of our listening is going to our lead player. And then 20% of our listening is on ourselves. And it's amazing. It's amazing just pointing that out and reinforcing something like that. How much balance and blend will improve just by a common understanding of where to listen. We'll also talk about in our concert band rehearsals how to balance our ensemble. Uh, we use the plug in process where we want our students to plug in to the lowest voice behind them that has their their um, that has their part. So if the flutes have are following the same thing that the trumpets are following, the trumpets in a traditional setup are behind the flute players. So we're going to have the flutes listening back and plugging into the trumpets. Now all the trumpets are listening up to their lead trumpet player. So really that lead trumpet player is in charge of a lot of stuff as far as as far as tone, as far as intonation and all of that. Um, one thing that I'll do in my rehearsals too to help with balance, and this is um, this is something that that uh, has been really effective is something that I stole from uh, Carmel, Indiana's uh, band program. I don't think any of us have really had an original thought and that's, and that's cool. Um, but we, I put my instruments into groups. The largest, darkest circle there is, is our group four. That's our bass voice. Our uh, next group, our next group, the uh, the trombone, baritone, tenor sax, bassoon, and marimbas. That's that's our tenor voice. That's our next. That's our our group three. Our group two is the alto, horn, clarinet, and vibraphone. And the group one, the soprano voice, is the flute, oboe, trumpet, and bells. And what I'll tell the kids, this is kind of like looking at a pyramid of sound from the top down. I'll tell the kids to. Uh, group three, you're going to put your sound inside of group four sound. Group two, inside of group three. Group one, inside of group two. It's kind of like a Russian nesting doll approach of balance. And the cool thing and the most useful thing about this is as I'm rehearsing a piece of music, I'll say, I need more group four. Okay, group two, you're way too strong. Listen to group three. Put your sound inside of that. And rather than calling out individual sections, I'm able to call out broad swaths of of things that are going on and balance tends to refine because kids understand what I'm talking about with the groups. Other things that can be unified are some standard note lengths. Um, the, <clears throat> the, the whole concept of, of how long to play a note will, if, if we can have unified thinking, will result in better clarity in our ensemble sounds. And so we can have 100% note lengths at tenuto, 75 at accents or maybe marcato, um, and 50% note lengths at staccato. We'll rehearse these things as part of our warm-ups. And again, doing this will help find some common understandings that will increase the engagement 
and increase the it's almost like sh mental shorthand right if, if i'm if i'm talking to to the uh the euphoniums and the ensemble who have got accents my like, guys more 75 more 75 on those notes and that's all i have to say and they're automatically playing it a little shorter well they they're freshmen so sometimes they play it a little shorter and then i've got to reinforce it but you get what i'm saying now the other another way we can go about unifying some things here if, if you've never used a lead sheet a unison lead sheet it's 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 fantastic um now what i'll do is i'll take the melody of a piece of music i'll take the counter melody i'll take some important other lines and i will score it out using finale um, with um, for everyone. I'll put the articulations there and um, we'll all learn all of those parts together. Everyone is busy. The tubas are playing the melody. I'm a tuba player. That's really important. You know, the ooms and the paws, they're fantastic. They're fine, love it. However, playing a soaring melody, ah, oh, you know, um, everyone will then also know the score. So how about in rehearsal, I'm, I'm, I'm visiting with, say, the flute players, and, and I'm, I'm addressing something that they're doing in the melody, and I'm saying, so Tubas, what do you hear there? How can, the, how can the flute players play their melody better? The tuba players will know because they've practiced and felt the part themselves. Well, they're, they're, not, they're not playing uh, staccato enough there, Mr. Girth or they're not playing with, with more, they're not playing the crescendo right, or, or those kinds of things. Um, so rehearsing marches this way, by the way, is fantastic. It really is. If you, if you, marches are designed with melodies, counter melodies, and you can have, you can have the tubas playing the melody while the, um, while the flutes and trumpets are playing the counter melody, or you can, you, you can mix and match. And it's, it's really, it, it, it really increases the level of, of cognitive engagement in rehearsals. So a bottom line here in this section is if we're unified in our thinking, the current communication and collaboration in our ensembles can flow at a higher voltage. So moving on to the next, the next segment here, creating a robust power grid. We talk about trust and empathy. And I think trust is the insulator in our classroom. If we're going to move to an AC setting where there's back and forth from a DC setting, this is crucial. With trust in the classroom, students are more likely to contribute they're more likely to challenge, to question, and to learn. Um, I want to just point out something here in this. In this, I, I don't like reading slides to people, um, but I do want to just highlight a couple of things. The, the very first couple of lines, just, just to uh, point this out. This is from the American Psychological Association. Teachers who foster positive relationships with their students create classroom environments more conducive to learning and meet students' developmental, emotional, and academic needs. In addition, a student who feels a strong personal connection to their teacher talks with their teacher frequently and receives more constructive guidance and praise rather than just criticism from their teacher is likely to trust their teacher more, show more engagement in learning, behave better in class, and achieve at higher levels academically. I want to point out the this this picture that I put up here on the, on the slide. I like this for several reasons. First of all, that black um, coating around the wire is a really thick layer of insulation. And then if you look inside, inside of each of those four smaller bundles, this is called a stranded copper wire. And inside of there is our individual strands of copper. And that to me is a great depiction, a fantastic depiction of our, of our ensembles. We're all different, we're all different strands of wire, but we're all bundled together in this, in this insulation. So how do we do it? You can ask yourself these questions. How can I encourage more positive conversation in my classrooms? How can I be more honest with my students? How can I be more authentic? How can I be more consistent? How can I admit more often when I'm wrong? 
That's a good, that's a, that's a big one for me, but even bigger for me is how can I avoid using so much sarcasm or sarcasm at all? How about this one? How can I be more open and open to and implement student ideas and feedback? I taught private lessons for a long time out of my home. And when I was working with higher achieving students who were working on all state etudes and things like that, we would get to the point where we would have our notes and our rhythms figured out. And I would just throw a question at them. I'd say, okay, how can you play this more musically? How can you play this, this phrase more musically? And the first couple of times we'd do it, there'd be a long pause because oftentimes they'd, they'd never been asked that question. And they timidly give me a, a response and we say, okay, let's try it. Sometimes it was the worst idea I'd ever heard, but we'd still try it. You really want to breathe there? Okay, sure, let's go. And through experience and through me trusting them to, to give me uh, to, 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 to give me their thoughts and we'd try it, then we'd talk about it. Um, that loosened up their their feeling of of uh, fear that um, they were going to be wrong. Our students are so afraid of being wrong these days. They're so afraid of it. And if we're not failing, we're not learning. So it's really important for us to give our students the, the climate and the culture in our rooms to, to be able to give us and give each other thoughts and feedback. Outside the band room too, be human with them. Show interest and ask them questions. This is an absolute fantastic uh, slide here. I didn't come up with this. I found it I, and I stole it. Empathy is seeing with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. Isn't that what we try to strive for in our rehearsals? And, and how we want to feel when we're creating music and how we want our students to feel when we're creating music. To put ourselves in the shoes of someone else in the room, perhaps, who's experiencing the music, or if we're playing a piece like, like, like Song for Lindsay by, by Andrew Boyson, um, or One Life Beautiful by Julie Giroux. We can put ourselves in the shoes of, of, of another in their experience. We need, to be, we need to be where our students are when they are. We need to focus on the musician more than the music. Uh, of course, we, you may have heard that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, and that's a little bit of a cliche these days anymore, but it's so true. Um, we need to show understanding and interest with our students and when communicating with our parents too. We're all trying to weather this pandemic together. We're all trying to do our best to get these kids from point A to point B in the most healthy, safe, and, and best way possible. Um, we are all human and the moment we see our students as objects, as obstacles to uh, our own achievement or as 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 the the roadblock to preventing us from performing this or that piece is the moment we begin to build walls. There's there's something I want to share with you this a, a, a friend of mine. Just this last weekend um, shared this with me we were we were, we were visiting um, and we need to make sure our students are seen and he uses a Google form to check in with his kids at the beginning of every rehearsal. He doesn't, not every student participates, but something simple like this. What do you want me to know today? Is a very elegant and easy way for us to check in with our kids. Um, he makes it anonymous. Students don't have to, um, they don't have to put their names down if they don't want to. Um, and he's told me that students have shared happy things. They've shared dark things. They've shared their anxieties. They've shared sadness. 
he's had students come out to him with this form. And imagine the power of, of just this simple thing. So if we can create, if we can create this, this web of trust and empathy in our programs, we're going to be insulating that wire and that wire is going to not have any power loss and power leaks and the collaboration is just going to amplify. <clears throat> Another book recommendation and this is a business book, but it's one that I make sure that I read every single year leadership and self deception by the Arbinger Institute, there is not an author listed here. Uh, and they did that on purpose it's just by the Arbinger Institute and this is has done more for me in helping me see others as humans with the same thoughts feelings worries anxieties hopes dreams as i do as i have rather than objects so i invite you to check that out all right so prepping for rehearsal takes on a whole new level of of um of care when you want to um, when you want to elevate um, that collaboration of course score study takes more uh, when you want to bring kids in so take a look at the background of, of, of this i'm going to take a sip of water because i'm getting a little dry um, take a look at the background the first person to pop in the chat the composer of this piece of music wins um, uh, bragging rights and extra bonus points if you can uh, if you can identify the the movement and the piece. Anyone? It's a bit tricky. All right. I will clue you in. It is Percy Granger, and it is the movement of, of Rufford Park Poachers from, from uh, Lincolnshire Posey. So, um, so anyway, as you're, as you're thinking about um, studying your scores, think about what you want. What we, avoid thinking about what you want to teach at your ensemble, uh, and Think about more what you want the ensemble to discover. Okay, what you want to you want to uncover what they want to discover. Now, score study and rehearsal prep won't always take this form, but if you want to think about higher level Bloom's taxonomy with synthesizing and and um, and, and and all of those higher level of of, of inquiry skills. Um, Thinking about it in this way um, will be will be very helpful. So there are other things you can do um, to to help amp this part of um, this part of score study too. You can bring kids in to to your study. You can give them the why. Knowing the why has been proven to increase our engagement. And increased engagement means increased. Uh, increased collaboration it, it, it means it, it means more back and forth um, spend a few minutes explaining uh where what where you're going to rehearse uh and why you're going to be, be rehearsing there in, 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 when you're starting rehearsals um maybe say okay starting at letter b trombones we're going to be listening to those a naturals to be in tune or how about uh, the phrases in this next section need to be uh, more clearly articulated can we listen more carefully and ask ourselves how am i matching the people around me um thinking about how you'll do this and how you'll uh, phrase these questions adds more richness to to your rehearsal prep and to the rehearsals themselves how about this? How about sharing your score with students? Um, you could share a prote protected PDF with your students or, or put it up via projection and teach your students how to read them. Imagine having a conversation with your students based on the text you're all reading. Isn't that what our English teachers do when they're studying a Shakespeare play? You're taking a look at the play, the entirety of the play, not just what Hamlet is saying, 
not just what Juliet is saying, not just what, 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 what any of those kings are saying, but you're looking at the entire play. Actors get the whole script. The cool thing about choirs is you see the entire score, but why not teach them how to read an entire score? Our students were in a sectional recently uh, and our percussion students in particular, I'm thinking of, and they were all playing their own parts. And I could tell they were doing it pretty well, but I could also tell that they had no idea what was going on around them in, in, within the score. So um, I said, would you like a score to, to look at so so you can actually see to make sure that you're lining up with 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 everyone else around you and the kids were like oh, yeah that sounds like a great idea so um, if you've never thought about sharing a score like that um, please please give it a try now so all of this all of this is to lay the groundwork for um, for the big idea here and you've actually been hearing me pepper it throughout the presentation and that is it's all about the questions the answer in fact, is in the questions, asking the right kinds of open, thought-provoking questions in and out of our rehearsals can move us from a DC to an AC classroom. Asking how and what questions raises accountability, which leads to increased investment, which leads to amped engagement, and it opens the floor to conversations and debate. Framing questions like this is easy to remember, too. It's just two words, how can I? or three, I suppose, how can I, or what can I? If you're referring to a section, how can we, or what can we? Um, and when you're doing this in rehearsals, it's important that you wait for responses. You embrace that comfortable pause from students. Because if you begin to answer questions for them, then you're slipping from, from this AC attempt back to this DC mindset. Um, one of the pieces we recently played um, in our third band was a beautiful and simple piece by Robert Sheldon calls called as twilight falls. Um, after a particularly dry run through um, I just simply asked our students, what can we do to make this sound more like a Disney love song. And the answers actually came pretty quick a lot faster than I anticipated they were talking about bigger crescendos here or there more legato um, longer phrases we need more group four, more bass voice um, that one question unlocked a whole flurry of creative engagement and immediate understanding and noticeable improvement and the next run through was miles better of course not every question that we ask in our rehearsals will be like this, nor everything that we say. But using these questions will lead to more collaborative thinking, more discussion, more debate, and more richness in our rehearsals. Questions you can ask in rehearsals to help encourage a DC classroom. What can we do to shape this line more? How could you create a more spine tingling crescendo here? How can the saxophones help the band sound more balanced here? What do we need more of here? How can we increase the energy level? Oop, went a little bit too far there. You could be even more specific, right? Trumpets. What can you do to match the first clarinet articulation? Wait for a pause. Wait, wait for an answer. Well, none of you were listening. Okay, clarinets. Would you please play from measure eight to twelve? Trumpets, please listen then you can have a conversation. All of a sudden, people are more engaged, they're being brought in. How about this? Amy, how can you create a more spine tingling crescendo on the suspended symbol? And then afterward, maybe ask the band do a, do a fist to five, five being the best, fist being the worst. So how would you rate that crescendo? Okay, Amy, how would you rate it yourself? Okay, so let's see, uh, Johnny, what, what would you suggest to Amy? What can you suggest? And those kinds of conversations now it does take a little extra time rather than just saying I want you to crescendo like X, Y and Z, but our job is to train uh, thinking and uh, responsive musicians, and I think it's worth that extra time. You could ask the tubas so tubas the oboes have this melodic line here how how do you think they should play that what what can they do to play that more more musically. 
Oh, I understand that you just have whole notes there, but but you, you can be musical too. have a suggestion for the oboes, those kinds of conversations. So before or after rehearsal is a great time for us to ask our students to reflect and to have more personal accountability, because sometimes when we throw the word we around, we're throwing that accountability outside of ourselves. When we say how can I or what can I, that puts the accountability on ourselves. So we will have our students journal and have and do some reflections um, sometimes after rehearsals and then have them look at it um, before the next rehearsal to kind of get themselves amped for, for what's next. We can ask our students, what can I do to play or sing more musically? How can I help my section more? How can I better contribute to class discussions? Uh, how can I apply the information I learned today? That's a big one. If you're still in Zoom land, or you still are working with, with students uh, or, or families using, using a, a virtual platform, instead of asking, why are these cameras always off? How about, what can I do to encourage more cameras to be on? How about instead of, when will this end so I can see the kids face to face finally? How about, how could I create greater community right now? How about, what can I do to communicate more effectively rather than, why are these parents never reading emails? How about, what can I take from this experience that will make us better? I think we're all kind of in that mode right now. If you're reflecting on how Zoom has treated us in the past and, and, and what we've learned, there are things that we can learn from this experience, I think, going forward that we'll be able to use. So we can also use this kind of questioning to tackle program direction to help amp our rehearsals and our whole program. Great questions to ask ourselves. How, what can I do to elevate our culture? How can I make more effective use of class time? What can I do to improve lesson attendance? That's a big one for me right now. How can we serve our school and each other better? Now, there are also great program-oriented questions that we can ask our students. And those would be all of the above and more. It's not just our program, right? If we're thinking about an AC culture, aggregate collaboration, we're part of the aggregate. So the kinds of questions that we're asking ourselves about what can I do to elevate? How can I be more effective? maybe those questions would be great to put to a student focus group or just save an extra five or 10 minutes at the end of your next rehearsal. Put the, put, put the baton down, pull up a chair onto the podium and say, so I've been thinking about a lot of this lately and how we can, how we can move forward as an, as an ensemble. What are your thoughts? And just let it sit and let it simmer. You might not get a whole lot of answers right there, but I tell you what, doing that more often, and we've, we've discovered this in our program, doing that more often will result in amazing benefits down the road. So I wanna, I wanna share with you another book recommendation. The book that shaped my thinking on this subject is called QBQ, the question behind the question, what, really, what, what to really ask yourself to eliminate blame, victim thinking, complaining, and procrastination by John G. Miller. Fantastic book. It's, a, it's an easy, quick read too. And again, this will be in the slide deck that Michaela will share with you. There are some other high engagement rehearsal techniques and strategies that will encourage collaboration. Um, reflective rehearsals and rehearsal by committee. This is where you're asking students to share out more. A lot of these how and what um, kinds of questions. The rehearsal by committee, um, I really enjoy. I use this with my jazz ensemble quite a bit. We'll play a section of music or a whole piece. And then I'll say, okay, saxes, trumpets, trombones, rhythm section, you've got 90 seconds, two minutes. Talk amongst yourselves about the things that you heard that you want to do better next time. I'll give them the time and then we'll share out. Kind of a think, pair, share kind of a thing. Recording and immediately assess rehearse sections of, of, of the music. Um, 
the way we rehearse, we're in person, but we're way spread out. Um, we have trombone, this last trom last chair trombone over here is in one zip code, and the tubas are way, actually no, the tubas are more in the middle, and I moved them. Uh, second trombones are way the heck over here in another zip code, and they're hearing different things. But if I set the microphone up in the middle of, of, of the ensemble and record it, and then play it back immediately, then the students have a reference to what they just heard live versus what they heard with the recording. And we can have some meaningful back and forth conversations about um, what's actually happening, what the audience would hear. Many of you have probably done this, but if you haven't, mixed up seating and rehearsals are fantastic for opening up ears as well as totally doing it totally random or in quartets. Totally random is so much quicker and easier to do. Um, choirs sing in quartets very often. And why is it always the tuba players will sit directly in front of me? It seems like the people in the back, except for percussion, we don't we don't move them, but but the the, the folks in the back are always coming to the front, <clears throat> and the folks in the front are always moving to the back. Um, <clears throat> I, I find that to be just an interesting character study. Um, if you have flat floors, you can also change up the floor plan. Uh, and then once you, if you do that and don't announce it ahead of time, watch the puzzled stares as kids come in and try to get their bearings. It's it's really kind of funny. And then you have to realize, oh, I've got to show them what to do. But anyway, um, uh, we've done it before. We have the conductor between the winds and the percussion, and we turn the winds to face the percussion. Um, I'd be standing directly in front of the percussion section. I hear things totally differently. I start to pay attention to the percussion score a lot more. Um, uh, we'll also shift to a football where we'll have two rows. Uh, we'll have band the, the front two rows of the band flip around and face the back two rows in percussion. And they're also hearing differently. And if you've got a small enough band or a big enough band room, you can go and play in the round. So to conclude, there are a few things that I just want to throw out. Um, this is a fantastic quote. Um, there is immense power when a group of people with similar interests gets together to work toward the same goals. And that's what we've been talking about when it comes to amping our rehearsals and, and having more of an AC, aggregate collaboration approach. Um, there's one more book reference, and I added this, oh, about two hours ago to the slide deck. Um, J.W. Pepper just came out with an email talking about some summer reading. And this one was was in there and the book Pass the Baton by Catherine Finch and Teresa Hoover looks to be a fantastic book on this subject. This is not in the slide deck, so if you want to make a note of this, it's on Amazon, it's on Pepper um, and uh, it looks it looks to be great. My, my copy will be coming on Sunday, thanks to Amazon Prime. So Pass the Baton. So just some parting shots, some parting, some parting uh, bits of wisdom or thoughts, I guess. Um, I've known too many well-meaning directors who live in DC land and push their energy and will on their students. And I think we've all done it from time to time. But making it a way of life results in a tired and frustrated director, underachieving students, apathy and uncommitted students, and low energy. Um, I think there's always plenty of untapped potential in our rehearsal rooms. Aggregate collaboration means being open to the power of our students. And as you're thinking about all this, a great question to ask yourself as you get started is how can I appreciate my students' gifts just as they are? Creating a trusting environment and planning for and asking the right kinds of questions will have profound influence on the amping of energy of your program in and out of rehearsals to foster an AC program. So with that, I want to thank Smart Music for sponsoring this webinar. And if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you, Jason. This presentation was so valuable. Uh, you gave us so many good summer reads, too. I love that. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we will see you next time.